I have to say, listening to your bio, you're like the guy in the Dostecki's commercial, like the most interesting man in the world, <laughs> like all over. Um, so I want to set some context of what we're going to try to cover to start. Um, you know, I got my start here, right here in Boston. You know, I've been with General Catalyst for about 18 years. And uh, when I think about what investing used to be when I got into business, it was all about building software companies. Um, and uh, you were either making some consumer experiences more efficient, or you were making some business processes more efficient, and then there were some underlying technologies that enabled those, right? That's kind of what venture capital used to be. Along the way, thanks to platforms like Facebook and AWS and others, those same entrepreneurs got emboldened uh, really all over the world. And they said, why do we go you know, be a software vendor to these markets? Let's just go disrupt them. So now entrepreneurs build insurance companies and modern banks and healthcare services companies. And there's a whole industrial revolution going on. We were talking about that earlier. Um, so it's, it's a pretty profound time we're living in. And it all started in 2007, uh, in my mind. And this is a long cycle we're in the mix of. So to start, what would be great to just, is to just reflect on the last 10 years, last 15 years since you know, uh, your Facebook investment. What is your view around innovation? How is it changing? And give us a global view, because we've had these two entrepreneurial ecosystems building here and China, and you're one of the very rare people that have gone and invested so successfully in both. So let's talk about that for a second, just about the last 10 years. May I first say, it's wonderful to be in Boston. I'm a native Bostonian. Um, grew up a native in Weston. Um, and it's a pleasure to be back in Harvard Business School. Uh, it was a wonderful graduate school experience. And Monica and Nathan are great friends. So it is, it's wonderful to be here in Boston. My goodness, where to start? Uh, moments for reflection, uh, I believe, are unfortunately too rare. Uh, but I'll offer some thoughts. Uh, what is fascinating today, which I've never seen before, and part of it is the advent of the AI platforms and the different software and hardware computing platforms that are enabling next generation services and products. Uh, the interdisciplinary nature of the teams that we are trying to put together in AI, uh, and I'm about two years into a 10-year AI investment business plan. Uh, the interdisciplinary nature of what's required is unlike anything I've ever seen. And we have a number of investments uh, together. Uh, Hamant has been a wonderful friend and partner on many, many deals. Uh, if we just take one example, healthcare and AI today. Uh, we're trying to obviously eradicate cancer in either our lifetimes or our children's lifetimes. Uh, with AI and the right teams, whether it's Path AI or the company that uh, I backed a year ago, Page AI, spin out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, what we're trying to do is pull together Nobel winning biologists, chemists, 20 or so computer scientists, physics experts, all coming together in these teams because all of these skills are required to build what will be, I believe, the, the really great breakout global opportunities in technology. And they could be in Bangalore, they can be in Beijing, they can be in Cambridge, Palo Alto, but they will be near academic centers. And so another thesis which has always been important, but I think has never been as important, is the academic centers, because of these interdisciplinary skills, will become more and more important over the next 10 years from an investment standpoint. And so whether it's MIT, Harvard, Stanford, UCSF, uh, the different IITs, Chinua, uh, so much of the talent uh, at the graduate level, the postdoc level is coming together in ways that I've never seen before. And it's why I think many of these AI companies are so profound. And one of the reasons there are such great opportunities 
we all know as companies get larger, as universities get larger, as bureaucracies keep, creep in, silos cannot be knocked down easily. And the wonderful opportunity for many entrepreneurs and startups is pulling these interdisciplinary skills together early without the silos and therefore work far more aggressively in product development, go to market in many of these vertical markets. I would say one other thing uh, about the AI platforms and it's a thesis, I'm not sure how it'll play out. I try to test and retest the hypothesis but the big generalized AI platforms and layers are really going to continue to be dominated by Alphabet, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Tencent, Alibaba. There are the different clouds, again, uh, Amazon, Google, uh, perhaps Microsoft. They enable a lot of the entrepreneurial opportunities, yeah. but one aspect that I think is more challenging than ever before uh, certainly, uh, if we go back to the Microsoft antitrust trial, uh, it's very hard to build now the broad horizontal AI platforms when Google has 600 PhDs uh, worldwide working on AI. And therefore, it's the vertical opportunities, which I think present enormous opportunities, where there's the interdisciplinary skills, near academic centers, because that's where the talent is, and they're global in nature from almost day one, and that's the Briar Capital Investment Thesis for the next 10 years. Yeah. So uh, there's a couple things you said I want to uh, uh, come to. So one is... I May mean, I interrupt? Your book is great. <laughs> so buy his book. Come on, can write. So there's, there's two um, clusters of companies you just talked about that are doing a lot of work in AI in the US and then in China. There's a global race. Uh, there's a philosophical difference uh, around uh, GDPR and its manifestations that are happening now in the US versus how Chinese companies and Chinese government think about AI. How do you see that playing out in the next 10 years? And how does that impact your investment thesis? Well, uh, I, as Hamad knows, I invested in Facebook in April 2005. It was a seven employee team. Mark Zuckerberg was 20. And uh, over the last two weeks, I've had two dinners uh, with Sheryl Sandberg in Menlo Park. Uh, the privacy issues, uh, in my view, by many of the large tech companies uh, have not been handled well. I wish Do you think that was intentional? Excuse me? Do you think that was intentional? Uh, I personally do not. I, I, I personally do not. I yeah. think some of the companies, and I can't speak to the inner workings at Alphabet, yeah. uh, but my goodness, when you have the growth that occurred and you have the data and a lot of it, as many of uh, the entrepreneurs and technologists in the audience know, much of the data uh, is unlike data which has been structured historically. But I'm optimistic that there are good intentions, and I do believe some regulation is important. Uh, but if we take healthcare AI, we talked about this a little bit earlier, uh, my goodness, how are we going to allow what is true innovation in artificial intelligence applied to pathology, to leukemia, to breast and prostate cancer, I could go on and on, where we can make a difference for doctors and physicians without though at the same time understanding who owns the data. Is it the hospital? It should be the patient. Is it the specialist or the general practitioner? I think we're just in the very early innings, very early stages of understanding many of the data privacy questions. And that's in the US. The UK is advanced in terms of health records and I think you'll see some cloud-based patient record systems coming out of Europe that are advanced. And then in China, uh, there of course is not a set of privacy state-by-state -state HIPAA regulations. So there are AI healthcare companies in China that are best in world at certain applications, whether it's facial recognition, which of course is much in the news, 
whether it's in certain levels of diagnostics for cancer, the area in the southern bay, the Bay Area of China, which of course is Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Hong Kong, Zhuhai, uh, that level of entrepreneurship I think is only rivaled in the world by Silicon Valley with Cambridge and Boston, Bangalore and some other centers being right on that list. And that's where I see so much of the innovation. So, so, so you mentioned uh, these epicenters of great universities and research would be where a lot of these modern companies get built. Well, this is one of those, perhaps uh, the best in the world. You also mentioned um, these teams need to be interdisciplinary. And one of my observations in, in this next generation of companies is, take healthcare for example, because you, you, I know you've, you're doing a bunch of work there. The right teams don't self-combust. So what ends up happening is uh, you have two kinds of companies that start in healthcare. You'll have you know, AI-driven teams. They leave MIT or they come out of Google or some engineers have done well and they want to do good in the world. Or you'll see um, uh, some physician that hired some software engineers, built some hack together code and thinks they're going to change the world. They all think they're doing this, they're going to change the world, but they're not interdisciplinary at the beginning. And I believe that's actually a hindrance to great companies getting built. How does Boston change that? Because they have those ingredients. Uh, what's any thoughts on building the best interdisciplinary teams? A lot of thoughts. We got time. <laughs> I, I think first and foremost, uh, the universities, the great universities, have to become better partners, and they have to become better partners from a licensing, from a licensing and private industry yeah. standpoint. Yeah. The great universities have to be better at working together at the highest level of the universities, as well as at the professorial postdoc level. Uh, universities in general are very poor partners. I was on the board of Walmart for 12 years, and we have a phenomenal CEO today. I'm no longer on the board, Doug McMillan. And we used to talk about this. Walmart was always a terrible partner for most companies. Uh, it just didn't have a knowledge, a feeling for how to partner. But in the last two years, they bought Flipkart and they've done some things uh, which I'm very excited about uh, and was very happy to have been part of the, way back when, the Flipkart Series A investment. Universities and Boston in general, we want the hospitals to not necessarily be competing with each other, but pulling together initiatives where many of the best hospitals can work together alongside many of the best universities, medical schools, and then there has to be an infusion of entrepreneurial talent. You and I see it, it's when we decide we're going to make the Series A or Series B investment, and there has to be an interdisciplinary understanding, empathy from the very beginning, because the competition now if we take health, uh, what Alphabet and Google, what they are doing in many of these AI initiatives, what Microsoft is doing, what Amazon is doing, what Facebook <coughs> is doing, is breathless in terms of rapidity and innovation. And so the opportunity for Boston uh, is to pull together this unbelievable population of postdocs, of students, of universities, but then have that magic Silicon Valley feel for entrepreneurial activity and that intensity. And that's going to happen in startups, and so I'm very encouraged. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, empathy for the problems, right? These interdisciplinary teams that win because they fundamentally understand the end user. Um, you go back to what I was saying earlier, which is so much of the innovation is about solving these types of problems all around the world. Um, do you think for the next 10 years, when you think about the great companies getting built that are trying to transform healthcare in the UK, to take your example, or uh, you know, retail in India, I know I, it, you would argue that all the tools are there and these companies will start becoming a lot more global, their opportunities are going to become a lot more global. Do you see that happening or do you still see it's sort of Silicon Valley, China's large epicenters and then Occasionally, there's a company like UiPath that happens in Czechoslovakia or what have you. Like, how do you see that changing? 
now that there's more proof points? There are more proof points, but we're in perilous insular political times. And so what is happening, for sure, is many of the very best Chinese AI companies are building out and scaling dramatically within China, where there's an enormous market. Uh, Cross-border investing, whether it's China, US, US, China. Uh, I'm co-chairman of IDG, and that was a very significant part of our investment set of initiatives for many years. There is no cross-border investment going on today. It is temporarily halted. Yeah. Five to ten years from now, I think there will be considerably more. But um, so that would bode well for more local innovation. Would you agree? Or? It definitely argues for more local innovation yeah. in the U.S., in India. It's harder. Uh, I was in India uh, for ten days in December uh, through much of the country, and. I can say the level of innovation and the entrepreneurship and the students I spoke to at IIT, it's phenomenal. What is happening, for better or worse, is we can go through the streets of Mumbai and every other block, there's a billboard, Netflix, Amazon Video, Facebook has four of the top five applications in India, but the acquisition ability for entrepreneurs to exit from India is also temporarily halted due to well-known legal and financial restrictions. So what is happening, it's all becoming more local, but it does mean that for certain markets, what was an opportunity to exit by selling the company to Tencent or selling your company to Alphabet or Amazon or Walmart, uh, that has become much more localized. So there are positives and negatives, uh, but the global markets may not be as global as they appear because of many of these multi-layered restrictions that continue to be put in place, first and foremost by the United States, and then elsewhere around the world. And again, a personal opinion. Yeah. Um, what are some of the other sectors outside of healthcare? I know you've got a deep passion in healthcare. As you're excited about over the next decade, where AI is going to make a difference and the next generation businesses are going to take share? Well, I, I think the focus, the general catalyst, uh, has been wonderful and we've had many conversations. Our first deal together uh, was a spin out called BBN here in Cambridge, Fresh Pond in 2004. And what was astounding about BBN, General Catalyst, and my firm at the time, Axel, helped management buy it from Verizon. It took a year of negotiations, which General Catalyst led and did a fabulous job of. And then for five years, we built important product. Uh, I would have never predicted that selling product to the Department of Defense called Boomerang that would help people stay alive. Uh, our combat troops worldwide. Boomerang was this sonar radar so important. that in the Iraq war was used that BBN actually produced you know, on a 68 day uh, time frame that they were given because lives were getting lost. So we sold the company in 2009 to Raytheon.